Hello everybody, today I'm going to show you my new camera, it's the Fujifilm X-T3 and it's a very, very beautiful machine, I've been shooting it for a while now. It's the successor to the X-T2 which I've got here and it's a lovely, lovely camera and uh, I guess maybe we're stretching the envelope a little bit for xenography the xt3 goes around goes for around about six to seven hundred pounds but why not we're not just about old stuff and a used xt3 is a very capable machine indeed now I've been a fan of the Fujifilm X cameras since I bought a used xt10 a year or so ago and I loved right from the start their orientation to the photographer. These are cameras clearly made for people who appreciate the art of photography and the machines that make that art, the cameras themselves. They've got all these wonderful dials on top which are reminiscent of a film camera. We've got shutter speed dial, an ISO dial, an exposure comp dial. And they've got all the wonderful Fujifilm film simulations built in. We've got all the old favourites like Classic Chrome and Velvia. Plus, new to the X-T3 is Eterna, which is a sort of a flat profile. There are lots of other detailed improvements too, because like all things digital, cameras evolve very, very quickly and I'm kind of surprised at the speed with which this XT range has evolved but there we are I guess that's digital tech for you so there are improvements to autofocus there's a new sensor with higher resolution and loads of other good stuff too so that said let me show you this wonderful camera so there's our Fujifilm XT3 and you can see it's an SLR design with the hump on the top here rather than the cameras like the XE2 and XE3 which are a rangefinder design. Fujifilm have all these wonderful dials on the top plate just like the old film cameras used to have. So we've got an exposure compensation dial, we've got a shutter speed dial, we've got an ISO dial. So really this is a camera that is very reminiscent of those old film cameras just like all the Fujifilm X-T cameras are. The body is a magnesium alloy weather sealed body so everything is sealed all the doors and all the ways into the camera are sealed. I've got a vintage lens on it at the moment obviously that's not sealed but the camera itself uh, if you're unlucky enough to be caught in a shower of rain, the camera itself should be protected. There's a very high quality feel with this camera. This is obviously a premium product. It's got a real classy feel and it, it just feels like it's built like a tank and the best materials and construction techniques have gone into it. Now I know some people have said that the X-T3 isn't as well built as the X-T2 but I just haven't found that. I've found that it has the same quality feel and there really is no difference in it. I couldn't put a hair between the cameras in the quality stakes. Let's just have a quick look at them side by side. So there are the top plates of the two cameras and you can see that they are very, very similar indeed. The dimensions of the two cameras are exactly the same and really bodily speaking, you really just cannot put a hair between them. Now, speaking of those dials, they have been altered slightly. The ISO dial is apparently a little larger, though I can't really tell there's slightly less resistance than the X-T2 
Um, some people haven't liked that. I don't find it any problem at all. The exposure compensation dial over here is now smaller than it was on the X-T2 and I'm not really sure why. I always found it difficult to find on the X-T2 and now it's even more difficult. The exposure comp dial on the Sony A7 is perfectly positioned. It just comes over the edge a little so you can find it with your thumb and that's really really easy to find. It's perfectly positioned. This one isn't and I do miss that ease of controllability. There is a touch screen on this camera so you can control the screen with your finger there. I'm not entirely sure why it's there but it's nice to have. It's handy for reviewing images I guess. I could certainly live without it but it's there if you want it. The diopter control on the side of the faux prism housing is now lockable so pull it out to adjust and then turn it and lock it by putting it back in. I'm glad to say that the battery is the same in the same place there. So there's certainly some continuity going on here and users of the X-T2 will find this one very familiar. Okay, let's talk about image quality. There's a new sensor in this camera, the X-Trans 4 sensor, and it has a resolution of 26.1 megapixels as against the X-T2 24. So that's a fairly modest increase that will allow for a little more cropping and you get that bit more resolution. It allows for a lower base ISO of 160 as against the X-T2 200, which gives apparently slightly less noise, although I must be honest, I never noticed excessive noise from the X-T2. At the highest ISO, it's said to give slightly more noise, though you're not likely to see it unless you're pixel peeping. I've certainly not been able to notice it. In fact, the images are not much different in nature to those from the X-T2. However, the image quality is fantastic. This X-Trans sensor, in fact all the X-Trans sensors, give images a unique feel. It's hard to put your finger on it, but you know it when you see it. It runs right through the X-Trans series, right from the original X-Trans sensor uh, up to this one uh, that I've tested, which is the most recent one that I've used. There's much debate about which is the nicest, but that's to miss the point. The fact is images from X-Trans sensors are in a class of their own. Of course, the sensor in this camera is an APS-C sized sensor. It's a crop sensor, roughly two thirds the size of full frame. Full frame images inherently have more shallow depth of field and probably a bit more dynamic range too. But that aside, there's nothing quite like these Fuji images. It's a different kind of sensor. The pixels are arranged differently in a more irregular pattern and that's what gives the unique look. Maybe it's a cliche but they do have a film-like quality and even if the film simulations are not always absolutely a match for the original film stocks, that isn't the point. These images are different to those from any digital camera I've used. I think that the JPEG files from these X-Trans sensors are more pleasing than those from any other camera. RAW's a different matter, of course, that's adjustable, but JPEGs are pretty much unmatched, in my opinion. If you like to cook your own film simulations on Fuji cameras, and I love to do that, I think that's one of the best features of them, and I'm not talking about the bundled film simulations now that come with the camera, but the extra ones that you can make in camera by messing around with settings. Well, this one, the X-T3, it can do all of those that the X-T2 can, plus some more. Um, 
not quite as many more as I'd hoped actually, but it can do quite a few more. However, and I was a little bit peeved about this, sadly there's no option to save your white balance settings while you're creating film looks. And that means that when you've saved a look, and you want to use it, you select it, you've then got to mock about adjusting white balance after you've actually selected that look. And for me, that's a real omission. It's not too big a deal, but it makes the process needlessly awkward. And it's a bit like the developers just went home one night and never quite finished the job off. I never really got that. And I wish it was there in this camera, but it isn't. If you're shooting with vintage lenses like this lovely old Leica Summitar here, well, you're going to enjoy it. These cameras suit vintage lenses beautifully. They complement the film profiles really nicely, and they just seem to suit the camera, which, after all, does its best to reproduce the feel of a film camera in a digital body so they just go nicely together so far i've shot the olympus 55mm f1.2 on this camera the olympus 135mm f3.5 which is a lovely old lens uh, a very cheap and very high quality 135 I've shot the Carl Zeiss Jena Pancola 51.8 on it, and that's one of my absolute favourite lenses. And I've also shot this lovely old Leica Sonitar 50mm f2. There's just something magical about shooting vintage lenses on digital bodies. And even a humble vintage lens in good condition will add some real character and sparkle to your images. And when I shoot vintage lenses, I really feel like I've got much more connection with those images as a photographer and as an artist. Through the mechanical controls of the lens, you've got a direct connection to those images that you're making. You're one step nearer uh, rather than one step removed which is sometimes how it feels when you're completely digital and using modern lenses and that mechanical connection really suits this camera it complements the mechanical connection that you feel through these lovely dials for example if you've not focused manually before and you're a bit daunted by it don't worry because it becomes very easy with practice, look back at most of the images, photographic images from the 20th century, and they were all made using manual focus. So, you know, this is a thing that you can master, and this is something uh, that becomes, well, in fact, becomes easy with practice. And you'd be surprised how easy it becomes to shoot, even in demanding situations like street photography, for example, where you might you might think, gosh, I'll never get the focus to nail the shot just right. But with practice, you will. And you can always stop down for a bit of zone focusing and explore that technique as well. So vintage lenses are highly recommended on this camera. Manual focusing with the built in focusing aids is very easy and simple. Uh, the one I use most of the time is focus peaking, which is where you get a little outline of colour around your subject when you're in focus. This camera has red, white and blue peaking, so there's always going to be a colour to match your subject or to stand out rather against your subject. It's not quite as prominent as Sony's peaking system, but it is very good. There's also magnification where you push a button and you automatically zoom in or the image uh, magnifies so you can get very accurate focusing. And there's also a digital split image which is where your subject is, uh, um, comes together. You get a split image and when the, when the image comes together then you're focused. And it's a little bit like the old rangefinder from the rangefinder cameras. 
I think digital split image is the least successful, in my opinion. I steer clear of it and I never use it, but certainly peaking is very, very useful, as is magnification. Adapting lenses is simple and easy. You just need a cheap adapter with the right mount at either end. And cheap, high-quality vintage lenses can be found for around 30 to £40, pounds, and even cheaper as well. For example, we've got the Jupiter 8, which goes for around 30 to 40 pounds. The Carl Zeiss Jena Tessar, which goes for 20 to 30 pounds. The Pentax Auto Takamar 55mm f2, around about 30, 40 pounds. And the fantastic Industar 61, which goes for around 10 to 15 pounds. So it's very easy and cheap to get started with vintage lenses it's easy to build up a kit of lenses they're much cheaper than modern lenses and they can really enrich your photography and get you further under the skin of the process and as well as that they'll give your images some incredible character and personality that a modern lens just won't so if you haven't used one before please do give one a go Shooting with modern lenses is, of course, much more simple in that you have autofocus, but actually I don't have many modern lenses. I still only have this one, which is the, uh, what is it, Fujifilm XC 15 to 45, 3.5 to 5.6. So I think this shipped with the... Uh, uh, some of the XA cameras, if I'm not mistaken. It's a nice enough little lens, but it's nothing spectacular. I know I should try some more Fujinon lenses, and I'm hoping to get one soon. Now, this camera is said to be much faster at autofocusing than the X-T2. It's got phase detection points right across the sensor. Many, many, many more focus points than the X-T2 had i'm not sure how many there are but there are certainly an awful lot of them there is a big improvement in face and eye tracking on the xt3 that was a weakness on the xt2 the xt2 was far far better than the xt1 in that regard but it still wasn't quite as tight as the xt3 is the xt3 really does keep uh, a good hold of focus on a face or an eye once it's acquired it and it's also got a much more accurate and better continuous focus system it's now a really reliable system that you can just pretty much set and forget and you know 99% of the time this camera is going to keep focus on your subject if you're in continuous focus so that's a real improvement over the X-T2 again the X-T2 was reasonably good at that but it wasn't as tight it wasn't as spot on and bang on as the X-T3 is so that's a real improvement too it's got a pre-capture mode as well which means that as soon as you half press the shutter button the camera begins recording images so that sort of saves you from flustering and blustering around and just getting the camera to your eye and as soon as you've got it ready to go and push the button well your shot's gone okay so this is a very fancy high-tech system which means that as long as you've got the camera to your eye and that that button half pressed you're not going to miss your image it's got a maximum burst rate of 11 frames per second I mean, that's incredible, but I can't see myself ever using it except to make some interesting stop motion type video. But of course, it is great if you're shooting sports or any other fast action where a fraction of a second really counts. So all those features together mean that the weaknesses in the X-T2 the face tracking, the continuous focus have been addressed in this camera. So this is a very capable, very modern camera that can cut it with the best of them. If you're a video shooter, well, it's really good news with this 
camera. This camera will do 4K at up to 60 frames per second and 200 megabytes per second. It rivals the GH5 in terms of its video specification and of course the GH5 was the gold standard for video shooters for many many years and probably still is. The X-T2 does 4K at 30 frames per second but with only a 10 minute clip limit and its 1080 limit still talking about the X-T2 is 15 minutes per clip compared to the X-T3's 30 minutes and also the X-T3 shoots 4K at up to 30 minutes per clip so that's a big improvement for anybody like me who needs a good video camera if you're shooting a drama or a comedy well you're rarely going to go over five minutes per shot. A documentary might need longer clips and YouTube videos certainly do. I shot quite a few episodes on the X-T2 but I always had my eye on the clock because of that 15 minute clip limit. The X-T3 by contrast can shoot for 20 minutes at 4K 60 frames per second, 30 minutes at 4K 30 frames per second and 30 minutes at 1080 also so it's a much improved camera in terms of the length of clips it can make it's got f-log if you want to get really serious that's a very flat profile for grading and you can also use the Eterna film profile to shoot video as well that gives you a flat look that you can adjust as you want in post now, the better continuous autofocus and eye and face detection are a real boon here. They worked pretty well, as I say, on the X-T2, but they're really tight and reliable on this camera. So a real boon for video. So this is actually a really powerful video camera, but it's not perfect. There's no stabilization built in. That is no IBIS in the body. So if you're doing handheld shots, you're going to need a gimbal to avoid jelly shutter. And there's no flippy screen. It just flips out to the side. Look, I'll show you. Um, the articulation is this way, like this. And so the screen sort of goes out 45 degrees this way. It would be so nice if it came all the way out to the front so that you could actually see what you're shooting. I can't really imagine that position ever being too useful to anybody unless I've missed the point and it's certainly no help to a video shooter. As I say, a shame that that screen doesn't just flip around so that you can see what you're filming but there we are. Nothing's perfect I suppose. There is a video light so at least you know when you're shooting. So should you buy this camera? Well, it's a very, very capable machine that sat right at the top of the Fujifilm tree when it was released, and it's not too far from that point now. It's still a very modern camera, and a used one is a lot cheaper than an X-T4. It's got loads of technical bells and whistles, if you're into that sort of thing. It's got very fast autofocus and really good continuous autofocus and face and eye tracking. The stills resolution is slightly higher than the X-T2 and it's got very much improved video performance, which in fact is why I bought it. However, if you're a purely stills shooter, it probably makes less sense because the X-T2 is pretty much indistinguishable if you're just shooting stills and if you don't anticipate too much cropping so is the 16 megapixel X-T1. In fact some would say the X-T1 stills are just that bit nicer than any other uh, images from any other X-T sensor x trans sensor personally i'm not sure how true that is but many people swear by those earlier sensors so honestly if you're mainly a stills photographer i can't see the advantage as such 
If you're looking to shoot video, though, there are very clear advantages. And as I say, you could shoot pretty much anything with this camera. But bear in mind there's no stabilisation built into the body, so unless you use a gimbal, which is going to make your whole rig really big and heavy, you're going to get jelly shutter if your camera's handheld. So if you do a lot of handheld shooting, a stabilised camera would be better. The cost for a good used one of these is probably in the region of six to seven hundred pounds or thereabouts, whereas the cost of a good used X-T2 is around about 400, that of an X-T1 around about 250 to 300. So if I were a stills only shooter, I'd find a nice X-T1 or even better, for around £200, an XE2 with the same sensor as the X-T1, but that much nicer, smaller rangefinder form factor. So that's my take on this lovely little Fujifilm X-T3, a beautiful little camera which I look forward to using a lot more. So that's about it from me for this week. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring that bell before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you'd like to support it and help it grow and develop, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash sonography and you can do it from as little as one dollar per month. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more Xenography.